Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Earthlings podcast. I'm Jason Adams, Executive Vice President of Earth Solutions, and I'm joined today by some really talented folks. Let me go around and do the introductions. CJ. Good afternoon, CJ Kowalki, and I am the Vice President of Sales with uh, Earth Solutions. And we also have Sean Bragg. Sean. Hi, all. I'm Sean Bragg, the product manager for our training platform. Great. And we have joining us today as well, George Walter. Hey, I'm George Walter. I am the director of technology for our training platform. And last but not least is Chris Hamrick. Howdy, I'm Chris Hamrick, and I am the brand strategist for the Core Sector platform. Great. I'm excited to have us involved here today. The goal is to learn more about Coursetra, how it has value for our clients, but more importantly, where Coursetra is heading. We've spent a lot of time building a great platform to assist our clients. And this is really the, the first time we've sat down and had a discussion about where Coursetra has been, where it's going, and what our goals are with the platform. So I'm gonna let George describe a little bit about the platform and why the ideas were conceived the way they were and where we're currently positioning the platform. George. So, yeah, originally the, the initial conception for building a platform like this was to figure out a couple of things, both about students and about what, what tools are used to bring students together. Now we're gonna evolve away from students in this conversation, but originally we were looking at students and education. And the idea was that there is a better way to both figure out what a, the way that a person learns, and there was also a better way to organize information so that we could best get the right kinds of information in the right strategic approach to delivery of that information to a specific kind of student. So for example, if you have a student who learns via videos, we would try and uh, specialize the content so that most of their learning material came in the form of videos, audio, et cetera. So it's important to understand that very in the very beginning, we were, we were pressing for an opportunity to teach better and to help people to build both teaching materials and help to identify how people learn in an effective way. Now, over time, we've had to evolve and we've had to change. We don't really talk about students anymore. We talk more about people who are learning skills. Um, and, and while you could call it a student, I think it is important to differentiate between what is training and what is education. Um, and so we have typically tried to now, now we come to a, to a place where we're, we're kind of trying to figure out the best way to help people become reliable in their jobs. Um, so we've had, to we've had to bridge a gap here. We've had to change some of our approaches, but originally it was conceived to try and do this for people. The shift now is to what kind of people do we really wanna do this for? Hopefully that, that gets, gets us along the way there, Jay. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think what Corsetra started as and where it's going and evolving to really is based on the feedback we've received from our clients. We've been very fortunate that we partnered early on with a lot of our one call centers who were leveraging the tool to deliver content and training materials to very specific audiences. I, I think it's a, an interesting opportunity to discuss like currently what some of our clients are doing and how we see that evolving. CJ, why don't you give us a little feedback on some of our clients and how they're currently using the platform. So it's diverse really in, in whatever the business's use case or need is, right? We have we have one client that has um, taken the more traditional corporate structure uh, of uh, and that use case might be something like onboarding uh, and bringing on new, uh, new, new members. Uh, and in fact, being able to do that, they, uh, through the use of uh, a very uh, regimented and scheduled uh, set of training materials and resources, uh, 
upon completion, they found they were able to kind of cut the onboarding time. And, and those folks were actually uh, interfacing with uh, new clients, new, new members um, in about half the time that it used to take. So they, they cut an onboarding cycle from six weeks to three weeks. You know, another really interesting use case is the concept of extended enterprise. And if you haven't heard that term, extended enterprise means you're setting up a, a training platform uh, for those who, everyone who lives outside of your corporate structure, right? So you're looking to educate and and train and certify those on uh, those members outside who, but but they do operate in your sphere of uh, uh, work life. So a good example for that might be you dig New York uh, with their uh, certified excavator program. Uh, and then to date, I think they're upwards north of 38, 39,000 um, excavators who have come through their system and taken their um, their excavator uh, certification program. Um, so that's an extended enterprise use. And then really there's the next, the next case, which is internal skill building and certification tracking and management. Uh, and those, those clients who are, who are using Corsetra, uh, in that case are, are being able to look into the system, identify individuals who have particular set of skills that would allow them to move them to different areas or regions, say that there was a vacation or, uh, a leave of absence that needed to be filled. It's a it's a way they are able to uh, management is able to quickly go in there and kind of see who some of those folks are who I can plug into that position um, based on their skill profile that they've got. So you've got a whole uh, gamut of different use cases, and it's really about what your business uh, needs and wants include. Great. You know, it's kind of interesting because it's from an outsider's perspective, it's pretty complex, right? Because what you're talking about is using a platform like Corsetra to deliver content or training materials to help people get better at really enhancing their skills and their jobs, right? And I think it's really important as we talk about this is why does Corsetra differentiate itself from other platforms when it comes to that? Uh, you mentioned with you dig New York, one of the things that we saw was a very wide group of people, uh, upwards of 30 and 40,000 people who spend time excavating, who are used to spending time out in the field and don't really sit in front of a PC all day and have to work in front of that and learn from that. So making it approachable, I think is a pretty important uh, aspect of that. I want to talk with Sean a little and say, hey, how do you do that? How does Corsetra achieve that? How do you do that through content? How do you do that in the tools itself? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we we are always doing is taking a step back and realizing that in this industry, the application of training and the use of technology, as you were just referencing, is very different than in other settings. So what we know is that we do have people that are out in the field that are hands-on, that are not in the mindset of thinking about training from an educational perspective per se, they're thinking about it as something they have to check off in order to do a job. So how do we give them presentations? How do we construct training in such that it's engaging for them, that it's accessible on mobile devices so they can do it on the fly because sometimes they're out on the field? Um, how do we connect them with materials that are useful, that they can understand? They're not gonna read a two page PDF about something but yet if they can see it in practice, then they can mimic it out in the field. So I think, I think the types of ways you engage them with the training are very important. Um, some of our clients want to have in-person seminars where they host events that people can come to. Well, in order for our tool to be successful, we need to provide the opportunities for people to register into this training and to have access for it. Um, our clients need to know when somebody has gone through that training out in the field, who has shown up, who has not shown up, who has fulfilled the requirements. So there's aspects that we provide that allows a facilitator to scan people as they walk through the door, scan their badge or scan a confirmation email. That way it's confirmed that who registered is who showed up. And then um, those people are excited to take back to their companies, the trainees, the, the learners that went through that program, they're excited to take back to their company. I have something tangible here that I can showcase. So how do we provide certificates of achievement 
or give them badges of accomplishments when they finished um, that they can take back and have something tangible to use. So we've incorporated those types of measures as well that kind of give them a little bit of um, benefit and excitement in engaging with this process. Nice, nice. It's been interesting to watch the evolution of the product since I've been around from the beginning of it. It's what we intended the platform to be and where it is today is just a better, more precise version of what we originally started. Because I think the goal of Corsetra was always, how do you demonstrate competency, right? I mean, how can we make sure that when the person is out in the field, they actually know what they're doing. They just haven't memorized it. Because a lot of times people can memorize and then be able to do it, but they can't demonstrate that. And that is a next step of competency. One of the things that I found very challenging as we were trying to really begin to build the platform was, what is the purpose? I think anytime that you're building something as a software company, you have to say, am I gonna deliver something that has value, that a client sees value in, but at the end of the day, also makes the users of it better than they were previously. CJ had mentioned earlier on how we have a client that was able to use the platform to distribute information, to make the onboarding of new employees cut in half. And that's an amazing opportunity for savings, but it also gives you an indication that you're getting good learners that who actually excel at learning, which are incredibly valuable assets in a growing business. Knowing that you can take your existing team and help them position their skills and get better, I think was one of the ideas that Corsetra really wanted to drive home. I think we spent a lot of time during this progress of really re-examining the core product itself and trying to make it more approachable. And Chris has really been instrumental in that work. Chris, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the effort that we've done in redoing the interface, making it more approachable and making it align more with this type of solution? Strangely enough, I think we started with simplicity. So we needed to get the interface out of the way of the purpose, which is to make it easy for somebody to actually learn and to train and advance their skills. And I think um, once we accepted the fact that simpler was better, we were able to actually make a lot of progress and remove things that were barriers to the premise of learning. And so once we were able to simplify the platform, we could then begin to really uh, make our, a true advancements to the functionality, to the metrics we could get out of it, um, you know, just being able to talk to the customers and hear how it was a better experience and they're able to leverage it better. Um, yeah, I really, it really started with, with stripping away the stuff that just got uh, cluttered over time as new ideas were added and sort of starting with a fresher base and getting back to what you're talking about, which is why are we doing this? What is the real purpose here? Let's just build an interface that serves the purpose um, that sort of cleared that path for us. Yeah, that, I mean, that's so interesting. I mean, it, it really, I mean, it sometimes takes a different perspective to come in and say, hey, what's the purpose, right? And then to be able to say, let's just simplify this. Where's the real value? Let's highlight how you access that real value and make sure that we empower the client to see that value, uh, which is different. And I, I think it's interesting. I want to talk to CJ a little bit about this. Traditionally, there's a lot of companies will have a very enterprise LMS type system in. And so when we go in to talk with clients, sometimes they go, well, I already have this. But I believe our solution isn't really a traditional LMS. And I believe we can make it more approachable and acceptable for our particular client base. CJ, I'm kind of interested, since you've had such experience in the LMS world when you, with your previous job, that you really have some experience. Can you kind of tell us you know, where you see the option and opportunity is for something like Corsetra, where clients may already have an enterprise LMS solution in place? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, the the evolution of this particular platform and type of platform is really interesting, especially on the back 
half of the COVID era, if we're going to put a name on whatever happened in the last two to three years, um, where where staying at home and getting the resources that you need became uh, ever more important, right? So, uh, and when we think about the evolution over the last 25 years, you get from VHS tapes, right? Where, where you were bringing on folks at uh, fast food restaurants and then, then the term CBT, computer-based training, on, on into you know the learning management space. And then that, that space has grown and, and blown up so, uh, so wide that uh, what we're seeing in, in this, in, in the 2023 day and age is um, being very vertically specific. And now even vertically specific, you get down into being uh, operationally and department specific. So the where and how that it's changed over time is it used to be a, a, an initiative that, primarily was housed in in the human resources and the concept of already have already have a, a learning platform well that's true but with resources being pressed the way that they are um a lot of times myself in operations i've got an initiative and i really need to get that to the field faster rather than later and so you saw a lot of lag time because internal um training departments and even e-learning departments uh, typically a smaller group a smaller subset to come along into that into that organization. So where we where we see it kind of going now is being able to have uh, a single point of access to to uh, have my department's uh, initiatives, skills, training, uh, and then have control over that because the control in the administration ends up being uh, one of those key things uh, that are usually roll up into permissions and how users and user roles are set up. Uh, all those are the complex blocking and tackling of a system like Corsetra, uh, and that that I think that we address. So going forward, I guess I would talk. You know, you've you've just seen a triangle uh, of of uh, an inverted triangle of specialization, right? Real broad, kind of coming down more vertically specific, operationally specific, and then even into de a department specific thing. So today. Those systems can live in, within the same ecosystem of an organization and have more than one uh, application to be used. Oh, interesting. It's, you know, I, I, during my process working with clients, our specific one call centers really weren't at an enterprise learning level. They didn't have a corporate type of learning platform. What they had were a lot of PDFs. <laughs> they had a lot of like uh, books, like flip books and that kind of stuff. And I think one of the challenges that we've run into so often is that people try to say, how do I get all of this stuff into your system? But I want it better. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the areas that we actually excel in right now. Uh, Sean, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, success that we've had in assisting clients both in taking their content uh, and getting it into the system, but also creating content? Sure. Yeah. And I think this plays into a little bit about what CJ is talking to as well. You know, you think about an organization and there's large training, right? And the concept of a new employee needs onboarded is obvious. What's not obvious though, is how that falls apart into practice when you get to individual teams and all the individual snippets that people need to know to perform their job well. So what, what we see is that although the company had an onboarding program, there is a sales team that needs some very specific sales um, information, for example, on how to position products, or there is a customer support team that needs to know how to interact with um, uh, their customer base, and they need to know enough about the product to support it. And both of those trainings are very different. So we have a team that we put together that will help work with um, anybody whether it's a manager, whether it's a, a, a company um, HR representative, we'll work with anybody to say, what is your idea? What are you trying to pull off? And how do we begin to outline what you're hoping to accomplish? Let's, let's bullet out the things that somebody needs to know in order to be successful with that topic or with that concept that you're trying to put forward. And then let's find the best resources to pull that off. So sometimes it may be, um, a series of questions that somebody has asked 
it gives them enough insight to know where they are missing information. And we call that kind of some, some pre-test or pre-assessments to let somebody know, oh, I thought I knew this industry pretty well, but it turns out there's a lot of questions that I wasn't able to answer. So it kind of gives direction on maybe where they can go to self-learn. Or maybe it's about taking some topics and very simply putting them into some video presentations that makes it very easy for them to consume. Or maybe some of the onboarding is understanding how to interact with the system. So can we put together presentations? Can we work with you to figure out for this particular software, what are the types of interactions and types of understanding you want certain people to have when they're interacting with it? And can we create scenarios where they are doing click throughs or they are walking through steps to actually learn how to interact with that? Yeah, the creation of content plays in a, a lot to what CJ was just speaking about in terms of how do we support smaller teams when the HR um, organization might already have it. So when you think about content, there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And so we've constructed a team that can help um, with identifying where needs are and and how you solve those needs in the term in terms of the details that need communicated about it so for example you know a, a sales organization may need very specific information and tools about how to position products whereas a customer support organization may need a very different set of information and tools on how they support a product those are two different angles so one um, broad training program is not necessarily going to address both of those needs. So our content creation team will work with individuals to identify what is the audience they are approaching and what are the best tools to put forward um, to help them with that. Is it a stimulation where they are actually clicking through a product and learning um, how to pull off certain tasks and what happens when errors are made or what happens when wrong information is entered? Or is it more of an overview approach where they are expected to understand the application in theory and how it affects businesses and how it affects um, outcomes from a, you know, a company perspective on what that product is trying to do? So our, our team has a bunch of resources available and we work with we work with our customers to figure out, um, are they looking to be lighthearted? Do they want animations? Do they want characters to portray things to make it light and fun? Or do they want to be very serious so that it's taken more seriously? And do they want to show the, the, the risks and the damages in, in terms of real life pictures and experiences to really hit home kind of an impactful message about the severity of the situation? Um, and there's a lot of different approaches you can take, and that's where small teams can really get benefit of providing training that is very specific to their needs and, and that will help their team members be successful in the specific jobs that they're trying to pull off. Well, that's, that's great. I think it's very interesting is when we first started working with clients and seeing these challenges, um, watching how our team really started creating content was really, uh, I think, eye-opening for me. And one of the things that I felt very quickly was I saw clients having success training their people on very specific areas and their people were excelling. And what that kind of set the light bulb off in my head that said, we should do that with our own platforms because... There's incredible value of doing great training when you're a software company because we can teach people how to use our tools better. And so it's kind of funny because we write great software and then we cross our fingers and hope that our clients use it really well. And then they call us when they don't use it well. And what's happened since we've started deploying Corsetra with training on our programs is our actual service calls are coming down. They're actually becoming less because our clients are better users of our own platform. So selfishly, I like making sure that anyone using any of our offerings has good training materials about our platform in it. So I've been really excited to see what we've done lately when it comes to creating great content on how to use our own platforms. I think that really gets the learner in the right space 
So that employee is now really excelling at doing that. And what's happening is now we're seeing greater acceptance of our other platforms because they're being trained efficiently using our one platform. So it's a really double victory for us. And what's happening with clients is clients are seeing that and going, what more can we start teaching these people to do? Uh, so I, I really love that idea. You know, Chris, I want to talk to something as kind of the really one of our lead strategic minds of what we're doing with the Corsetra platform. I was really impressed with the idea of saying, how can we go back to what you were saying earlier, simplifying the goal, simplifying what the platform does. And I think we're really starting to drive to say, how can we make teams better? So in that mindset, kind of give us an idea of the repositioning of Corsetra and why we're really trying to target, I think, a, a more simplified approach to making teams and individuals better. I think it really comes down to taking a step back and asking why. Really getting to understand why somebody wants to train a member of their team. What do they want to get out of it? And one thing we know for sure, at least with the customers that we work with in the industry that we work in, that the stakes are extremely high. That making mistakes is something that they have to avoid at all costs. And so when we do take the step back and we think about training from that perspective or the, the whole course lecture platform, we really have to think about how how we can impact that part of their business, the mistake part of their business with the tools that we've created. And so we start to shift the focus from just talking about training and start to talk about why we train. And then that allows us to make the connection of talking about the people that we're training and how we can be a part of their lives so that they're more qualified to do their job. And so that the people that are overseeing them are able to um, help them avoid the mistakes that are going to have a huge impact on those businesses. Nice. CJ, can you explain that maybe? Yeah, I think when Chris brings up a great point, right? The, the why, why, why do you need to, to uh, provide this platform or rather, why do you need to train? Right. So and I think what's interesting is the motivation about the adult learner. And that's a that's a very deep conversation. The motivation of the adult learner. We all went to, you know, uh, primary and then secondary school. Right. And then uh, if you went on and got, you know, education further than that, you did it because you were trying to achieve something personally. Right. When we we're little kids are we had to because our parents said, go get good grades. And we're like, OK. But uh, now, now we're now we're adults. Uh, adult learners are totally different, and so you get into the motivation that Chris was speaking to is the why, and the why. If you're in New York and you're an excavator, the why is it's the law. The law is the why. Um, if you're uh, an organization or a publicly owned utility or an investor owned utility, you might say the why is because this is how we do it, and if you're going to contract with our with our company, this is what we want you to know, right? So both internally and external contractors who might work with a with an investor in utility. Um, the other thing that we've seen lately is remediation. That The why is so I don't have to pay the $1,000 fine. Uh, I can remediate that fine by, by attending and taking training. So if it's going to be served for remediation, let's do it effectively. Let's do it with a plan and a path with objectives, clear objectives that you're looking to uh, to accomplish. And then after that, um, provide that feedback. You've completed the course. So I'd be uh, I'd like to roundtable and ask everybody, really, Sean and George, what they see as that why and how we can encourage more use of the system. So my thoughts. Interesting. George, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a a lot of thoughts on what everybody said so far, but one of the things I think that's important is identifying what it is that will make them and us more effective at what we do. Um, so we talked earlier on, you brought up LMS and that's 
that's that's a term we're trying to get away from because we're really not an LMS. Um, what we do is we try to solve the problem of credentialing, training, and insights. Uh, those are the three things we focus on from a technological standpoint, trying to get across to people. So credentialing is something that everybody does, but we we need to get the words right. Right. In our industry, I don't know what the words personally, I don't know what the words for cred credentialing are, but it's that process that you when you look to assign a person to a job, you know, they can do the job. Right. So where do you go to know that the person you're about to assign to a job can do the job? Our technology helps you to do that. Right. Our pr product helps you to do that. The training Sean talked a lot about. So when we talk about why that's the thing that follows the person. I always say to my family that the most valuable thing that I can invest in and th that I believe they can invest in is the thing that can never be taken away. And that's what you know and what you're trained in and what makes you a professional. What differentiates you from an amateur, right? It's that you are trained to do a job that you that you gain experience in. So it has to go beyond just the training. It's got to take into account what you are doing now professionally and feed it back in so that now you have something permanent that goes with you everywhere. And finally, those insights. I mean, uh, Chris brought this up a number of times and Sean brought it up. It's the system is not very valuable at accomplishing anything unless it can give the people who you who use the system not the people who are who are being trained with the system but the, let's talk talk about them as administrators of the system some insight into how well their training is doing are they asking the right questions like sean indicated earlier and are we able to tell them how effectively people are receiving training. It, also, are we able to tell them that this person already knows all this stuff and doesn't really need to go through all of this training? They're already credentialed, right? So there's value. So, and, and finally, to, to talk to what CJ just said in, in a in sort of a round table approach, why do we do what we do? At the end of the day, I think it comes down to we want to reduce the number of damages to zero. We have a phrase that we're popping around right now that we, I really love. Zero is possible. So what is that's the why? That's the why, in my opinion. Maybe we maybe we toss it around a little bit. But if we are looking to do that and we are not addressing credentialing, training, and insights, then I don't think it's I don't think it's possible to get to zero. But with those things, I think it is possible to reduce to zero. And boy, what would this industry be if there were zero damages? You know, I find it very interesting, George, as you bring that up. Uh, the CGA has made a pretty strong commitment to reducing damages fifty percent in the next five years, right? And I think that's a wonderful deal uh, statistically what we could do if we saw those amount of damages, the amount of money we would save from an organization as an industry, but more importantly, the amount of human lives that would be left uh, intact and not have to have some of the consequences that we've seen by challenges in this industry is pretty important. I think one of the things that I found interesting listening to you guys chat is when you're looking at some of the platforms out there today, one of the biggest pushes that we're seeing in our world is better use of data, right? And we actually have felt very good since the size of Earth Solutions has grown so much recently that they have more data around our industry than just anyone. Right now, actually, we receive over 130 million tickets. These are great data points. What that does, it gives us more insight on risk because now we can start trending what happens to cause risk. And one of the biggest, I think, challenges our industry has experienced is a lot of companies are now identifying this data. But the question is, what do you do once you've identified it? And to me, this is where Corsetra really starts to shine. When you say, 
We've identified a challenge, a very specific challenge, and now we want to try to educate to move past that. And so I think, to me, risk is the question of, of how this is occurring, and Corsetra is the why we're going to fix it and how we're going to fix it solution. And so I think it's really important. You know, Sean, I want to kind of chat a little bit about how we can really build curriculums around specific types of activity to really extend the learning process. Uh, I know you spent a lot of time doing that. Can you give us a little insight? Like if a client comes to you and says, I've got this challenge, what steps do you take in order to have a successful uh, platform using Corsetra? <clears throat> yeah, you know, Jason, I think it's twofold. And one of those is we've been talking a lot here about training, but at the root of what we're really talking about is the people. And I think sometimes, you know, we have this vision of, um, of shifting away from necessarily the LMS terminology. And I think the reason is because what we've identified is that LMSs tend to focus very much on training as an outcome, but I'm not sure everybody really knows what to do with that. Uh, but what training is doing is empowering the people that they are working with and they do know what to do with the people. So when we approach um, our clients the, to address some of their training needs, I think when you, when you take out of the equation talking about it from a training standpoint and you say, well, if you're looking to put your person out in the field, what are you looking for that person to do? Or what do you, what does that person need to have in their um, bucket? What do they need to have in their backpack uh, of knowledge to be able to work with? It kind of puts them in a different light. And then it starts to say, well, yeah, I know that if I'm going to be standing next to Joe and we're going to be out in this scenario, there's certain things that I want Joe to be able to do. And I would like him to have a base knowledge of these types of things. And I think it makes the conversation a little easier. Um, approaching that from a, a person perspective. So I think that's that's one of the first approaches to that training. And then, and then obviously, as I had mentioned before, deciding then the best ways to interact with Joe so that he can learn that material, the best ways to report that Joe has these skills or needs more information on these skills or, um, uh, how, to, how to tackle that person, I think, makes the conversation easier. The second part that I wanted to address is, again, we talk about damages and we're looking at the CGA wanting to reduce, you know, 50% of the damages. And I think what we've noticed on our team is that there's a lot of, of conversation around technology and the use of technology, but there's a huge factor in that, and that is the people that are involved. And the best technology in the world can't solve everything if somebody completely unqualified comes to the, to the table and uses that technology incorrectly. So I think what we are seeing is a, a, a real strong um, need for the person and what they are bringing to the table to be identified, to find out what the gaps are with that person and what the training needs are. And that's the, kind of the first place to start. And then once you've identified those gaps, you identify what they need. Now we can kind of put together the materials and the education and the presentations that are going to help them get to that. Point. Yeah, I think it's um, as we really start to look at the effort to reduce damages, like the CGA is talking about in their 50% in five years, and then we start to look at that and start to say zero is possible. I love that because I think we're aligning our platforms to reach what the industry is trying to accomplish. But what's even more importantly is that we've all now understood that with proper training, proper education, putting the correct parameters in, we could make a difference. And I mean, that's what we're really trying to do. And so it feels good, I think, to sit as part of the team that is trying to really help an entire industry reach a common goal. And so aligning our zero as possible is really not just a statement, but it's a mindset, right? It's really to say, 
Am I doing the steps that will efficiently make me more safe in the field and protect other people? And I think as you pointed out, Sean, just the ability to take care of our people and make sure our people are in the best position to make those decisions is really what an employer should be doing. So I, I think that's great. You know, I kind of want to talk to CJ a little bit about the challenges of working with a client that is looking at bringing Corsetra on, what are the steps they should be thinking about to justify this kind of purchase? And what more is there to this than just simply saying, I want to buy a training platform and then crossing your fingers and hoping it works? <laughs> right. Um, it's a good question. And it, it runs, again, very the, the situation can vary to the individual needs. Now, one particular situation uh, might be is I think you you hit on risk, right? And risk is a moving target. How can I get what I'm trying to educate my operational team or an excavator community? How can I get it forward faster? And so we're talking about speed to uh, from time of inception. This is in my head, and now I need it to uh, a producible resource. Uh, so I think that's that's one very key. Uh, aspect of of that particular situation. Uh, the second thing is, depending upon the size, you know, a lot of organizations under 200 employees, this might be a department you just don't have. And so partnering with Corsetra and the Corsetra team, uh, we end up being that uh, con uh, consultant who is essentially your uh, e-learning uh, or uh, e-training e platform. Uh, so we can serve that need. Um, and then you ask specifically from a preparation standpoint, like you said, everyone's got legacy uh, PDFs, PowerPoints, all those kind of things. Those are still usable. It's just not organized in a way that you can actually use them probably very efficiently. And that's that's one area that, that Course Cetra needs. Uh, furthermore, uh, we all know that organizations have the uh, uh, legacy knowledge, right? Uh, this guy, this uh, individual has been here, you know, 40 years, he knows it all. But when he leaves or he goes on vacation, where are we? So it's a it's a way of uh, extracting that, that, I don't even know what the term is, but that walk around knowledge and getting it into a place where I can have it be a resource and a tool for the, the newer uh, associates to whatever our organization is. So I hope that answered some of your question there. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I tell you, I think capturing what I consider a lot of times I use the term local knowledge, right? The person that's been doing the job forever. You know, it's funny because we're now, or at least I'm at the point where I'm seeing much younger people in the audience. I used to be the young guy there. And so it was like I was learning and I didn't really have a very good playbook other than stumble and not try to stumble the next time, right? And what I see is, is even as we're doing this right now is can we capture the knowledge that we have and make it accessible to other people? And, and to me, that's really such a significant advantage of what Corsetra brings the ability to is kind of pioneering that mentality of let's start documenting and capturing what we're doing so we can pass it on and make it more valuable. And then let's also see what of that knowledge is actually valuable? Because there's many times I've got knowledge in myself that I think is correct. And when I go to demonstrate it, it turns out I'm incorrect. So one of the things that I loved about Corsetra has always been the ability to help you fine tune that learning. Just don't say, hey, X plus Y equals Z. Not everybody gets it that way. Some people may see it a little differently. So this gives you a, a really a cause and effect equation to actually see what I'm training. Is it getting the effect I want out in the field? And so really capturing that data, I think is awesome. I think so many times people go, I'm going to buy this tool. I'm going to use it this way. And that's all I care about. And sometimes I just want to sit down with users, of course, and say, you've got this tool. Did you know it can do X, Y, and Z? Matter of fact, I know George wants to talk a little bit about the opportunity of maybe bringing Corsetra and using it with some of your other applications from a technical instance, maybe like in credentialing, making sure that quality controls are in place, those kind of areas. George, kind of talk to us a little bit about how Corsetra can be used in conjunction with other platforms to make sure that you're doing the right effort and that we're making sure the right people are doing that effort. Yeah. That's a big deal. 
I think that's, well, I might be wrong about this and I'll invite our clients to correct me, but I really believe that it's a big deal to be able to integrate the entire product line as a suite. So you have a product line that's mission critical to you in, in ticket management in this industry, right? You, you, it, it runs your entire suite of employees, your, your entire suite of, of, of uh, deliverables. And so how do, how do we integrate into that in such a way as you can know when you assign a person to a job that they're credentialed to do so? You know, if, if they go through the process in course in Coursetra, which we're using the term Coursetra, but that's up in the air right now. I'm sure Jay's going to talk about that at some point. We're, we're trying to find something that integrates better, that talks to what I'm talking about right now, that actually the branding integrating as well as the product integrating so that it's a suite of products, right? So we're, we're throwing around words like skills and, and um, ID, but really we are trying to make it easy for someone who's assigning out the job responsibilities to know that the person they're assigning them to has the skills to do them. This particularly becomes interesting when you need a different skill set based on location. Like this location has a set of credentials that differentiates from that location. And you could have inner city places where you can do work where they have their own set of credentials. So how do you manage that and say that these people are credentialed either based on experience or training or ideally a combination of both? So how does Coursetra or our skills product integrate into the ticket management product? That's one way. We've talked about being able to decide whether a person can be assigned to jobs or can use the ticket management system based on having gone through a set of educational uh, modules. Um, that's the simplest way to start. But there, it's much when we start talking about insights, the insights that we gain in the process of training and credentialing can now also be used in determining risk on your ticket management. And all of this now can come full circle. Now we have training feeding into risk. We have behavior feeding into risk. We have damages feeding into risk. Now we're getting a much more accurate picture of what the risk is. And the more accurate that picture, the more likely we can get it to zero. You know, that, that's the beauty I think of integration. But without integration, it's like every other LMS out there. It's just a training platform that you, as a company, that the companies we serve, has to figure out how to integrate on their own. Um, so as we integrate it directly in their product lines, and we have one call products, and we have, we have ticket management products, we have risk products, we'll have more and more products as we grow. Uh, I, I can't imagine a product that cannot integrate with qualifications, training, and the insights that can come from those things. So yeah, I think it is very powerful. And we've got some powerful technology that we don't have a clue how to use until we know how to direct it. Like it's like having a laser. You, you, it's useless if it's pointed in the wrong direction. We've got a augmented reality. We've got virtual reality. We've got um, artificial intelligence. It's all things like chat GPT, right? How do we use something like that, incredibly powerful, to help to include into our, our training platform? Well, we do it by integration. Integration is going to teach us how to, when these tools are effective and when these tools are ineffective. Um, and I just imagine things, there's so many wonderful tools out there. Jay used to always talk way back in the old days about the shovel that you, the, 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 the backhoe that you could, that would never cause a damage because the moment you stuck it in the ground, it would tell you if it was something on, underneath of it. And that's a beautiful concept. The idea that we, we start building these kinds of tools that make it so that you just don't, you don't damage things. And that's, that's my thought on integration. You know, it's funny. I saw a comic the other day and it was these kids uh, making a joke about how silly homework is now because chat GPT writes all of the things for them. And, and, and it kind of 
made me laugh. It kind of made me think that I remember when I had an old TI-81 calculator and I could put stuff like things into it. And I thought I was like cracking the code of school. I can't even imagine today what chat GPT does. It write a book report. Well, I go ask a thing and it writes an incredible book report that most professors, if they didn't know was generated by AI, would think it's a work of art. And so, of course, I like to play in that area. I like to do that stuff. And I've just thought, how about the uh, impact that AI is going to have on learning and education? Because really, it's becoming, can we create better learners? Yes. But really, what we need to do is create smart people and teach them how to use the tools better so they can advance. Because if we believe that we have to continue to teach people that one plus one equals two, we might be doing a disservice to an audience because what they really should do is be learning how these tools work so they can then use these to rely on them. And I, and, and I use this for a perfect example. Every book in the world was written, you know, using a typewriter, you know, 75 to 90 years ago. That's how it was done. And today that idea, no one does it, or maybe very few people do it. The tools change because now spell checking comes in and all of these different things have evolved so much in such a short period of time. What we're seeing now with new tech, chat, GPT, mid journey, some of these areas, I think will change everything we're doing. And why that's critical, I think in our world is because we're seeing more advanced users. So the next generation of people that go into our actual industry are going to look at learning completely different. They're going to know how to learn so much faster and our tools need to be adoptive of that. So as we're having conversations, how do we integrate ChatGPT's engine into Coursera? How do we extend its capabilities? How do we reduce risk using AI? The world's changing at a pace that it blows my mind. Uh, and I think that's very interesting. Chris, I'm sure you're, you're kind of a pioneer in tech. You've done lots of great, interesting things over the course of time. I'm kind of curious of your thought process around AI and what that looks like and maybe how that can affect the future of our platforms. You know, it's a great question. I, I honestly don't think I have an answer. I have not put a ounce of thought into AI for, for Coursera. I apologize. No, no problem. I, you know, I was thinking just the other day, one of the cool things about Coursera is that it asked different questions, but focused on the same objective, right? Because what we want to do is make sure people aren't memorizing, Hey, a real simple statement, you know, the dog is wearing a red coat. If I remember that, I only have to know that the dog's wearing a red coat. But if I want to make sure I actually remember it, I might ask 10 different questions. I could say, was it warm outside when the dog went out? And you would say, no, because he put a coat on. Well, Chad GBT can really take one question and give us 12 questions very similar, but asked differently. So I'm excited about the possibilities of seeing that in a, a kind of a dynamic question pool as we go back and forth. So I just think there's some really interesting opportunities. I'm, I'm really excited that I think that our development team and our core support structure really is trying to promote even more integration with modern AI tools. So as we kind of wind this down, I think we've done a really nice job talking about this and I think it's gonna be a valuable tool. I kind of want to give you each an opportunity just to kind of uh, present what you think the future holds for the platform and where you see the greatest value is moving forward with the platform. And CJ, we'll start up with you. So I believe what the, the significant value in and where we go from here is and what we offer is a complete 360 solution on what's in your head as far as what you might like for your operation and your operational department uh, and, and being a partner in training. So one of the things we really didn't get into too too much is our assessment engine, right? That's a competitive advantage. Our assessment engine is remarkably robust, and it allows us to get to a lot of the uh, a lot of the core things we were talking about in terms of competency and measuring competency, right? And and, and I'll take this example. I took a, I went through another training platform and I got certified in 16 minutes, only because I guessed on the on the test, and it 
I just got to retake it. It was the same question. I got to retake it until I got it right. So I, I got certified 16 minutes. The point is, again, 360 solution where you got an assessment engine, a place for resources and objectives that guide all of those things, right? And so as you look at us as a partner, um, we've got instructional designs to help bring your content to life and to make a more in, interactive resource. We have the platform and then we've got the assessment engine. Uh, on top of all that, take all the tech and put move it to the side and you look at the, the team and the partnership uh, and the support that you get with the Corsetra community and our, our clients who are so willing to jump in and help one another. Uh, that's a recipe for success in a kind of a departmentalized uh, uh, learning and training platform. And you take everything else we've been talking about in terms of skills and certification, tracking, management, and it will help you better identify those who are well prepared and well suited to the job than the task at hand. Nice. I, I think, uh, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head with the assessment piece. And I think it's probably the most critical integration point for our platforms with the other offerings that we do, because it's the thing that allows us to validate is the effort worthwhile? Are you getting what you're trying to accomplish? Are we fine tuning the process and can we do it better? So yeah, I think that, that's definitely nail on the head. Most of our clients that are using the platform today see the total value in the assessment piece, but I think that's just the beginning to be honest with you. I think that is what's gonna differentiate and really define success moving forward. So I'm glad you brought that up. Sean, I'm curious on your thoughts. Yeah, I think as we move forward, I think a critical piece of that is, again, kind of going back and focusing on the person and and what makes them qualified. How do we consider them ready to do the job when you when you match that up against the original conception, which was we need a competency based um, system that can facilitate whether somebody's competent in a certain area that doesn't always have to take the form of me providing you with you know, specific resources to learn it. There is a future and there is a direction that Corsetra can take where I need to know that you're competent. I need to tell you what competency looks like. And you may have a bunch of different tools at your disposal that you can go out and use to figure that out. And how do we integrate with those? It, does that mean pulling in mentorship information or assessments and evaluation? Does that mean that you have tool sets out in the field and then you come back and you answer an exam that proves, no, I do. I was able to go through these steps. I was able to verify it. So I think the more we look at how we qualify people and then figuring out how we pull the information in that validates that, part of that is training. Um, part of that is beyond training. And the more we can identify those, I think it kind of sets the path for how Corsetra really stands out in that arena. Nice, nice, I totally agree. George, I saw you nodding your head quite a bit there. I think uh, you probably agree with Sean in some ways. I'm curious on your thoughts. Yeah, uh, I agree with both CJ and, and Sean, which should be unsurprising. Um, but I, this, the, the focus on qualified people is so critical. Um, and it is, a, it, it is something that um, while, while the product, Corsetra, is not complete, it is positioned well to tell you who's qualified, to help in the qualification process, and to continuously identify how you can improve the qualification of your people. That concept that people are the key to being successful in any industry lends itself well to Corsetra who focuses on those qualified people. So what, what CJ was saying was, was so spot on. The number, he, he outlined the number of ways in which we can both provide and capture information to get to qualified people. And because that's the focus, and Sean brought it up earlier, training is not the focus of Corsetra. Training, training is a means to an end. It is not the end. And if there's a differentiator between Corsetra and other LMSs, it's the understanding that training is a means to an end and you need to incorporate it with other aspects of qualifying people. Um, so 
that's the power I think of Corsetra. I think if we can if we can focus on that going forward in our process of development and our process of of interaction, like uh, CJ brought up too well, we have an, a completely non technical solution that we provide in terms of our our educational depart our department that builds educational content. That's people working with people to help people become more qualified. And it's it it's not the LMS. We we have much strong we have a we have a strong offering and I think it's I, I think the power is just knowing that it's all about people. Yeah, I think um, you know uh, I, I'll let Chris kind of finish up, but one of the things that really struck me as we started to begin this process about really trying to take Corsetra and make it more approachable, more uh, valuable to our client base, Chris really hit on something that I think brought it all together to me. He wrote, when avoiding mistakes mean everything, we'll help you build a team you can count on. And with the tagline that zero is possible. That struck a significant chord. It hit so quickly. That to me said, this is what we should be doing. So Chris, I kind of want to give you the last few words here of what you were thinking on that, why you think that's achievable, and just kind of the mindset around it. Yeah, I think it's it's a reflection on the fact that what we're building at Corsetra is meaningful. If we do it well, it has a meaningful impact on the world. And and being able to to deliver on that well, it, it it's important and um, it's fun to be a part of that. And I think it's also exciting because, um, you know, we know our industry really well and we'll be able to deliver on this for the industry that we're starting in. But Corsetra is bigger than just this industry where we're starting, you know, in the damage prevention industry. Uh, all industries in some way have some part where uh, mistakes are need to be avoided. There's risk. There's consequences to those risks. And the concept of Corsetra and helping avoid mistakes is uh, something I think we're going to see is pretty universal. And so where this goes, we don't know exactly yet, but I think it has a pretty substantial potential to have a meaningful impact in the entire world. Yeah, I think, man, what a great way to end this uh, first episode of the Earthlings podcast. Uh, I really want to thank each of you for all of your time today. Uh, putting this together, I think will have incredible value for both our clients and our staff. It's been really interesting hearing your guys' perspective. I think if you guys want to really kind of finish this off on a high note, the most important thing that we're striving for right now is that zero is possible. And that we believe, as Chris so eloquently pointed out, what we do makes a difference. And we wanna empower our clients to make a difference with their community. And so I really wanna say thank you to each of you and look forward to doing this again. Thank you.